are watching West Harper Community yeah. Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. For the community, by the community. Welcome to Art Talks, a show where we talk to and about artists and their work. I'm Joanne Bauer, host of the show, and I'm thrilled the, today to have with me three artists. Two of our artists happen to be poets. This is something new that we haven't tried before. And our third guest is a visual artist who's graced our space. So I'm going to talk, talk first with Ginny Lowe Connors, who is Poet Laureate of West Hartford, recently named Poet Laureate, correct, Ginny? Yeah, that's right, this, uh, early this summer. Yes. And What's, what actually does a Poet Laureate do for the town? A Poet Laureate makes up the job as he <laughs> or she goes cool. along. Um, I'm trying to initiate a project for the town, but a Poet Laureate might give readings, might do anything to encourage uh, the enjoyment of poetry in town. And I think you're the, am I correct that you're the fourth? I am the fourth Poet Laureate. The town council has been very supportive of the arts in this town. And the first Poet Laureate was Maria Sassi, who's been kind of a fixture in town for many, many years. And following her were Dennis Barone and Jim Finnegan, two poets who also are, have strong ties in the town and many people uh -huh. know them and their work. And am I correct in assuming that Jim Finnegan, when he created WordForge, was that part of an outreach or was that different? I don't know. He's always been active in the poetry community, yes. but that is certainly a wonderful program that he has going That's on. That's absolutely true. We're talking about WordForge, which is a, a monthly poetry series that happens at Billings Forge in Hartford. So now you have the project that you've initiated, mm -hmm. and what's that called? It's called Poetry in the Parks. Poetry in the Parks. And it would involve uh, community members and poetry and sculpture to get park uh, poetries in the park so it's accessible to the public. Now, how did you, what, what inspired you to think about this as a project? Well, you know, I like to go to poetry readings <laughs> yes, and that sort right. of thing. And I see other people who already know they love poetry there. Mm -hmm. But there are many people who could enjoy poetry who maybe don't seek it out that actively. Right, so this would make it more accessible to yes, the public? Yes, and put it out there where people would, could enjoy it and delight in it. How many parks do you have here in West Hartford? I believe there are six. Six parks. So you are you envisioning that there will be poetry in each of those six? I would like to work toward that goal, yeah. Right, and so you're doing a collaborative venture, and I know that the mayor is behind it and behind this project, and you'll have sculptors. And so how do you see the sculpture and the poetry interrelating? Um, we're first going to solicit some short poems from people who live or work in West Hartford or are connected to West Hartford that might reflect something about life in the town or something that they're inspired by in one of the parks. And a committee, uh, hopefully with the former poet laureates on it, oh, uh, cool. will look at the poems and select some that they think are suitable. And then we're going to put the call out for sculptors. And it can be individuals or it can be groups. Oh, and we're going to ask nice. them to be creative and submit a plan for a sculpture that, a sculpture that can go outdoors and in some way incorporates the poem. It could be as simple as a box on a stand with a little door that opens and the poem inside. could be much more elaborate than that. Right, and so, so first you're going to solicit the poetry, right? and then you want the sculpt, so the sculpt 
collectors would have access to reading the poems. Yeah, right, and, and they would choose one mm -hmm. that they thought they could work with. Excellent. And so the, we're looking for poems now. Good. Through mid-January. Excellent. So that would be January 11th, is correct, that correct? Correct, correct. So that's a deadline, everyone. January 11th, if you are a poet and you'd like to submit. For example, Andy, I know you, you and I together, are part of the Faxon Poetry Group here in West Hartford. So we'll talk it up. Good. We'll see if we some shall. of our Faxon buddies would like to would like to be part of it. Because yeah, there are some West Hartford folks in Faxon also. Uh, absolutely. Right. And we have here a, a call for poems. And let's see, we have a description, right, Ginny? Right. You've written up the description. And where could folks get, get this information? There's, there's a couple of places they could get those. Mm -hmm. um, the town website has a section on things to do in West Hartford. And if they go to that, and look for poetry and click on that, they can get those. Okay. My personal website also has those, GinnyLoconnors.com. GinnyLoconnors.com. Well, now that you're mentioning your, your website, Ginny, I, I know on your website you have some images and some ekphrastic poetry. And if our audience has been paying attention, we talked about ekphrasis a few months earlier when we were talking about Open Studio Hartford, where we have the Ekphrasis project. But if they ha weren't paying attention or they've just tuned in for the first time, how would you describe Ekphrasis? Um, it is artwork that stimulates creative work in other areas. So looking at a photograph, a painting, uh, something such as that, a lot of times uh, writers might get involved. And writing often involves imagery too. You know, we try to create imagery in people's minds. So there's just a natural cohesion between the two. So lots of times I will look at a photograph or a painting and just want to respond to it in a way that I can, which would be with words. With words, you're quite a wordsmith. So really it is that, that response to another type of art. Now you've brought with you some poems today. Mm -hmm. So shall we start with one of, Kandahar, one of your maybe? poems? Kandahar, okay. yes, because we also have the image that, that inspired, is that how it went, that image inspired this well, poem? Well, a couple of things came together with this poem. Um, I have two sons actually who are in the military and one of them, when I wrote this poem, was serving in Kandahar uh, as a helicopter pilot. And I was worried about him. Of course. And while that was going on, I was looking through images of a collection of paintings from my aunt and uncle, who are deceased but were both artists. Really? And I found one named Kandahar. Wow. And I looked at that, and the poem arrived. Wow. So the, the so the image was a rel had crea was created by a relative of yes you. a number of years ago. Well, l then let's hear your poem. Okay, this is Kandahar. Single handprint on the wall, where so much has been erased. In the breath of a whisper, a candle flickers. The carpet's intricate patterns, a language beyond words, a history a genotype, generation of dreams, one laid over the other, over the other. Oh, Kandahar, the woman who painted you is gone. The man in the whitewashed house is gone. My lanky son in goggles that make him strange, a helmet clamped over his thinning red hair. Why is he there in the whirlwind of your refusal? The cloth on the wall is frayed. Behind it, a fretwork of messages, red dots, blue boxes, cuneiform. What is history, Kandahar? What is love? When will we remember what it is to be human? In this charged world of our own making, how will we grow the right kind of skin? That's Kandahar. And I really can feel it as a mother's expression, too, in addition to an accomplished poet's expression. Oh, yeah. It all comes and together. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Ginny, I just <coughs> do want to mention that you, you have won many prizes and you have several collections. Could you tell us a little bit about, or name the titles of your sure, full-length collections? Sure. My uh, most recent collection of poetry is uh, called The Unparalleled Beauty of a Crooked Line. And there's a poem in it with that name that was also inspired by a piece of art. Excellent. Um, a previous collection is called Barbarians in the Kitchen. Motherhood plays into that one a little bit, okay. too. Okay. <laughs> um, I have a chapbook that was a Sunken Garden winner that's called Under the Porch. Absolutely. Let me just say, Sunken Garden for our <laughs> audience. Sunken Garden happens out at Hillstead, Hillstead Museum every summer. And it's just a wonderful it's experience. Been fabulous. going on for 20 yeah. years, mm -hmm. and you were one of the uh, prize winners. Right, they've been running a chapbook contest for several years, and the winner gets to read at the Sunken Garden, which is a wonderful. big honor. Wonderful. And I've edited oh, several anthologies too. And you have your own publishing company, Grace and Books. Grace and Books, wonderful. Ethan, now we're going to talk about your visual art. You are a self-identified multidisciplinary <coughs> artist, but you've brought, you also do photography. Yes. But you've brought your paintings tonight. Tell me a little bit about the inspiration. The inspiration really comes back from, like I said, it's, it's art. It's always art inspiring art. Um, oh. So art, life too, life as mm -hmm. much, but I think there's a lot, it's, I take from, uh, the paintings of the past, or or even um, or even decorative works or whatever, it yep. doesn't really matter. It's like the the elements that I really want to bring together, and it's nothing that I actually have uh, in front of me. So a lot of the paintings are just from memory in a way, mm -hmm. like shapes and form that I want to you know juxtapose mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, so in this one, for example. Was there a, a an art piece that inspired your creation here? No, no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. and that's actually a new project that I I <clears throat> may be moving into. Uh, uh, well, it, it's probably inevitable, but in the future, I just don't know when. Where I would like to take some uh, very historic works and just kind of apply my mm -hmm. style to them uh, to to see what can be done. You know, because there's a lot of compositions that. Uh, they kind of uh, keep coming up over and over again, and I think I'm tapping into those in, in one way or another. Um, so almost a Jungian's archetypes. Is that is that how you meant it? Uh, in a sense, you know. Um, I think like the mo uh, mother and child, Madonna and mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. you, you see these over and over right. again, and they have a certain kind of kind of setup. But there is sort also the other power. very powerful historic paintings. You know, there's there's ones that really do stand out above and beyond the rest. Oh, I mean, so okay. you're right. looking beyond the technique or skill of the artist, where you know you're looking at the composition and, the, and how much they have going on. Right. Uh, so right. Bellini has this amazing work, uh, the Magical Nativity, which mm -hmm. was like I think 1600s, and I would like to approach that one day. Well, that seems like a very cool project to take on. Yeah, I think why not? How do you do you when, do you make any comparison amongst your pieces? All three of these are are yours, and in fact, I realize I didn't say your last name, Ethan Boisvert. Yes. And would you spell it for us because it's French, uh, right? Yes, and, it is. It's uh, B O I S uh, V E R T. Right, and we and we also know that your website, or I know your website, is ethanboisvert.com. So I yes. wanted to make sure we get that yeah, mentioned. Ethan uh, so easy to go to. That's the best way to see my work. I'm sure you have, you have lots of images on your website. There is quite a bit, yes. So do you ever in your own mind make comparison amongst your paintings? Uh, uh, obsessively. You do? Obsessively. <laughs> um, How does that go? <laughs> Um, it's, I start to wonder if painting's bad for me because I'm, <laughs> I 
<laughs> when I start doing it, I can't, uh, it's hard to stop and I'm um, trying to keep functioning with my day-to-day -day things, paying bills and going to right, work and stuff like that. Do, is it because you're absorbed into it? Yes, very much so. Uh -huh. It's kind of like really being in the, the moment. In the um, moment, in the flow. In the flow, mm -hmm. um, like mm -hmm. anything else where like if you're a rock climber or a basketball player mm -hmm. or a musician, like you're just feeling everything and you, and, and then a lot of times with the painting, there's a lot of question marks because I'll, I'll take a picture of it, put it on the computer, and then I will look at it, rotate it, add, do, do some things to alter it yeah. to see, uh, you know, because sometimes things can't be undone. If you look at this, there's a certain amount of layers that yes. you cannot, once you cover it up, and if that paint dries, which it does very quickly because I use acrylic, then <clears throat> you can't really recreate it. You could... You could do something that could be better or something that's similar, but you can't ever really go back. So um, I do test things out a lot on the computer to see if, I, if what I'm going to do is going to strengthen the composition or weaken it. I'm fascinated by how you use the technology. Yeah, is isn't it? Because, you know, I, I, I'm not a painter that often, but even with other media, there's always the stepping back, the rotating, as you're saying, but mm -hmm. you're using the computer then to try out different layers. Is mm -hmm. that part of what you can do? Is um, this Photoshop? Well, there's or? a certain amount of layers, or there's something <laughs> about like uh, simplifying a composition. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to think of anything. The best image to look at, maybe this one, take this, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Take a photo of this and say, let's say I was like, not happy with this this blue which i'm actually very happy with yes um and so you i would go in there and say say i thought maybe it should be white and then photoshop i can paint it white so at least oh, i can see, I see what the the color change is going to do this one was completely reworked yeah this one was pretty much painted over and redone really recently, really obviously. and uh and so and and so the at some stopping point, it mm -hmm. was very, very different from what you have now. What, this one? Yes. This one, it wasn't even the same painting. I literally wow. obliterated it. Yeah. And it was because it just, uh, I think I had gone too far with the form and there was not enough. The big thing about it is like any really, some of the, see any of the real strong artworks because there are you know the movements of minimalism and pop art and you know i really much thoroughly enjoy a warhol mm -hmm. or uh you know uh, Sal Witt, for example mm -hmm. right but uh something that really makes a, a work for me that i'm always going for is like the the the, the mm -hmm. amount of variation like um, as much oh. variation as possible while still being able to keep it together so it's you know, when I talk about synthesizing abstraction, it's like, you know, I do take from different movements and even other artists who are like, mm -hmm. you know, we can look at like the Favs or the mm -hmm. uh, uh, cubism is definitely influential in the, in the mm -hmm. structure of the mm -hmm. layout. And um, and um, recently I'm interested in another artist, Milton Avery. He's less known, but people who yeah, really and he enjoy is known painting. Around here. Yes. Um, well, Milton, I think of Milton Avery as uh, a bit m less complex than yours. Yes. 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 You know, it's interesting to me, one of the first notions that when I was studying art and beauty, one mm -hmm. of the first notions that I came across was this idea of the most complexity that still manages to hold together and mm -hmm. have balance. And mm -hmm. it's almost what you're saying, I think, is what, part of how you've described it. Andy, I want to come to you because you are here as our second poet and our performance poet. And could you tell us a little bit? Well, actually, could I just go back one second? I'm sorry. This is how, how informally it goes. I do want to say, Ethan, that you've, you've won prizes too and been acknowledged mm -hmm. and have, have had commissions, I guess would be the way to say it. You've done lots of big, big pieces yes, in, yes. in downtown settings and the bus, the bus shelters, bus shelters in West Hartford? I did that, and the Hilton Hotel commissioned me a couple years ago for a very large work. Right, and one in uh, Watch Hill. Watch Hill, I, I, yes, I was there, there was another commission. That. Uh, and they're very nice because I'm just doing what I'm doing. You know, it's, it's like, you know. Getting paid to do what do you love my to style. do. It's, I, and I never have, you know, gone from that. I don't, someone says, do a portrait. I'm like, nah, sorry, I can't do that. You know, it's not really. Right. So you're not trying I, to fit yourself yeah, into Yeah, no, not at all. It's not artist for hire type of thing. So right. it's really, it's good. 
you know. So, and I just recently had one with David Panagor, uh, David B. And Panagor. And he was of, he uh, was city manager, right? I see. He was a Hartford. chief operating officer, chief. and so mm -hmm. he, very large work in his studio uh, loft now. Wow! In his home. Yeah, in, in his, his home. home. Yeah. <laughs> Floor to ceiling is that what I was? Floor thinking? to ceiling. It's yeah, amazing. it's uh, thirteen feet wow. by twelve feet. So then, Andy, the connection I'm going to make here is that I know you, you have professional gigs these days as a professional, uh, as a performance poet. And what else, how would else would you describe the work that you do? Um, performance poetry in itself, right off the bat, um, a performance poet uh, uses the platform as a stage. So much like ekphrasis or ekphrastic poetry, mm -hmm. um, we use props. We use, um, you know, different. I use different dialects. Right, um, that's right. Know, that kind of thing. You use your voice. You use, you use your rhythm. Percussion. <laughs> I've been a percussionist for fifty years. So you in, you hope to walk people through uh, the whole piece that way. Just enhance it a little bit. Right. That's all. And, and just mention some of the places that you've been performing and doing clinics most recently. A um, lot of libraries. A um, lot of libraries. A um, <laughs> lot of libraries. Uh, I, do, um, I did one outdoor thing back in September at the Northwest Park in Manchester, which is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It overlooks a beautiful uh, pond over there. Oh, okay. And um, my... My workshops are called Senior Voices, Expressing Yourself Through Poetry. Right. And I work with, right now, 23 different uh, senior assisted living places. 23, and 23, say? coming up on 25. My goodness, so you're all over the state? All over the state and in, now in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and taking a little bit of it into mm -hmm. Florida. Wow. And, you, and you've also been honored and won, won an award, right? yes, recognized nationally for that work? Mm -hmm. now, uh, in 2012, I won an award, um, Best of the Best, from the Assisted Living Foundation, which is based in Alexandria, Virginia. Excellent. So, Congratulations to all you. of you. Andy, you've brought some poems with you. Mm -hmm. Would you like to perform? Okay, I'll, I'll give you... Um, as I said, you know, performance poetry is, is visual. Oh, goodness. All um, right. <laughs> oh, no, you need more. In fact, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to introduce you real quickly to what this is. I'll give you the truncated version. The Joanne, truncated you may, version? Maybe you'll hold that for yes, everyone. Yes, I'll hold, hold it up. this. <laughs> that is called a kakuza. Wow. I first heard that word, a kakuza. Um, the story, very quickly, a kakuza. In some, some parts of Italy, so the Italians pronounce it, kakuza which is really how it's done. Excellent. It's uh, used to refer to as squash in general. However, the flavor is a combination of summer squash and cucumber. Uh, I was having dinner with friends. They told me the story of how they don't really know their neighbors that well. And there's a, a fence dividing the property, a wooden fence. And growing from their neighbor's fence over the fence are vines of those. Wow. Okay. Really? And um, yeah, I mean, to a point, they yeah. multiply like rabbits. They really wow. grow fast. My friend took it off, looked it up on the internet, uh -huh. and kakuza. So and from there, your mind went spinning into a A very poem. disturbed place, yeah. Yes, go ahead. So <laughs> I now give you, this is by no means great poetry. I had a ball doing it. This is called, Is That a Kakuza on Your Fence, or Are You Just Happy <laughs> to See Me? Oh, God. Oh, yes. We can't often pick our neighbors, it's truza. Sometimes we win and sometimes we lose her. Yet given a choice, I surely would choose her, the folks next to you with their fence of kakuza. They're hardly at home who knows what they do, za. perhaps party people <laughs> who down lots of booza. But one thing's for sure, it's no lollapalooza. Your food bill's much less, and they're getting screwsed. <laughs> Like fish in a barrel, not a hint, not a clouza. You pluck what you want, be it ten or just twoza. <laughs> a dash of minced garlic, some dill, that'll do ya. It looks like a squash, but that is what fools ya. For breakfast, for lunch, cook it up with tofuza. Amazingly <laughs> phallic, oops, forgive, please excuse ya. Well, the years come and go with more aches and more bruises, replete with more naps like those afternoon snoozes. Then one day it doth happen right out of the bluesa. You've been really great neighbors, they say. We sure hate to lose you. But we do miss our kids and our grandkids. boo hoo <laughs> The reason we're moving to warm Santa cruz -a. So you wish them the best manners learned from grade schools. -a. If you come back to town, you say, stop by and we'll schmooze -a. As they turn to depart, the idea comes to you. 
No parting <laughs> gift. That just wouldn't be cool, Zah. You hand them a ripe one and become quite amused when they say, fancy that, never seen a kakuza. <laughs> so that's the story on that little. And that is so you, Andy. I, I want to say that you and I have been part of the Faxon group for about three years overlapping, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's such a, a convivial group in large part because of your humor. And this is a big piece of how you perform and how you bring people into your performance. Well, I want to thank each of you for coming in and thank, of course, the station manager here in the station and our uh, camera people who help us out and provide the, this show for the community. And again, this is Art Talks with Joanne Bauer.